Greetings, this is J.R. Dickey. Thanks for tuning in to our podcast. And by the way, don't forget our website, graceandtruth.net. I hope you're having a great day, but if not, hang with me. It's about to get better. Okay, today we're going to talk about one of the primary characteristics that I think we're going to see in heaven. Okay, let's get started. Never had he seen such a sight. Oh, Jonathan, the king's son, had fought many battles, and the people had often lauded his achievements. Indeed, he was next in line for the throne. But this this was something special, something that truly gripped his heart and brought a whole new perspective. Before him stood a young man with a ruddy complexion. His face was familiar, of course, for the young man had entertained his father with a harp before this war, before the present trouble. But now, at his side, dangled the huge, bloody head of the once dominating Goliath. Even as it swung, his grotesque, savage face made him sick. Who are you? His forgetful father, Saul, had queried, likewise amazed at what he'd witnessed. This boy, David, had just single-handedly taken out the greatest enemy of the nation. A display of faith and courage unparalleled in their history. Without a doubt, it was the hand of God, for the antagonizing monster had towered nearly ten feet tall, at least twice the size of the boy. David answered, The son of your servant, Jesse. Kaboom! It was at this point that something happened in Jonathan's heart, as amazing as David's display of courage and faith had been. His heart attitude afterward was even more so. There was no chest pounding, no pretense or feigned posturing, no assertion of the king's obligation, but rather what Jonathan witnessed was an attitude of pure humility and it somehow prompted his own heart to respond. And now, inwardly, it was something he just let happen. His soul became knit with David's. The heavenly master weaver entwined the very fabric of his heart with that of the humble giant slayer before him. And because he loved him as his own soul, they made a covenant, a holy, unbreakable promise to one another. And responsively, Jonathan did something that, although absolutely appropriate, may have left those watching aghast. He took his princely robe, his armor, his sword, bow, and belt, and gave them to David. It was completely voluntary. He stripped himself, so to speak, and thus is presented. In Scripture, a lesson for us in type and picture, for in like manner... There stood the largest and ugliest, the most rotten of creatures, Satan. Like Goliath with Israel, he taunted and bullied all of us with sin and death. And every one of us were fearful of his gigantic threats. Even those of us upon the throne, who, when you think about it, is each one of us, for we've all sat upon the throne of our own lives, but then appeared the Good Shepherd, who came as a servant. He spoke of faith and the greatness of his God, and with a single stone, one rock, one noble act, the cross, he forever destroyed the destroyer. Now, like the king's son, Jonathan, we may have seen him before, but regarded him as a mere distraction, an entertainment perhaps, someone there just for our selfish benefit. But when we recognize his meekness, his humility, his strength so completely under God's control, we likewise are compelled to, if I could say, strip our own regal coverings, to lay at his feet the armor we've hid behind, our sword and bow, you know, that which we've used in say, hand-to-hand fighting, or at a distance to inflict others. And there we lay our belt, that which has previously held it all together for us. This is when our heart is knit 
with the son of David, Jesus. For although the greatness of David's deed was unparalleled, it was the humility, the character of his heart, that was overwhelmingly attractive. So it is with Christ, the son of David, and consequently it rewires our circuits. Our surrender to him is a heart-changing response to his own humble surrender unto God the Father. His deed was, is, and always will be indescribably awesome, but his character is even more so. The deed illustrated it all for us to see. Oh, the awesomeness of true humility. Not merely the occasional outward self-abasement we can use to flatter ourselves, but the holy heart and mind clean of the filth and fantasy of unwarranted pride. You see, this is the stuff of heaven. You know, there are no, I'll call them, proudsters in heaven. No one looking for flatteries or temporal esteem. You might say that heaven's air is love and heaven's fragrance is humility. That's how I see it. There we will know endless, fulfilling relationships, perfect joy and explosive grandeur amidst this beautiful scent aroma. There we will fully realize that it is our omnipotent king who is the source of this wonderful scent. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so high are God's ways above ours. You can see Isaiah 55 for that. Yet the high way is in deed and character the low way. That is, when the Creator looked upon our desperate, self-destructive world, the one who is all-powerful, all-knowing, all-present, he decided to come to us. Not only so, but also to empty himself of his divine powers. He bridged the infinite gap between us to become, literally, a single cell, an embryo, a fetus, a baby, a toddler, a child, a teen, and a man. And as amazing as this is, and truly incomprehensible, we need to understand that it was not out of character. It was an act that expressed and expresses who he is. Purest love and purest humility. Check out Psalms 45, verse 4. Now, humility is scorned here on earth. It's usually associated with weakness. Consequently, in its sincere form, it is rarer than diamonds. For every thought of mortal man opposes or disdains it. Humility is not the attribute of simply being less prideful or less self-consumed. Rather, it is the absolute absence of these sin-motivated characteristics. On the contrary to the world's inclination, the Lord instructs us to seek it out. That's in Zephaniah 2.3. And to put it on, Colossians 3.12. But why? Of what benefit is humility? And why is it so dismissed in this world? Well, among the many blessed promises for the humble, the Bible tells us that God guides and teaches the humble, Psalms 25, 9, and that they are glad in heart when they sense his pleasure, Psalms 69, 30 through 32. And thus God is pleased with them and beautifies the humble with salvation at Psalms 149, 4, and unmerited favor. James 4, 6, Proverbs 3, 34. The humble have wisdom, Proverbs 11, 2. And honor, Proverbs 29, 23. And increasing joy, Isaiah 29, 19. In addition, God dwells with the humble in a high and holy place, heaven. Isaiah 57, 15. He revives them, 57, 15, too, and lifts them up, James 4, 10. As a matter of fact, the words for humble 
in both Testaments means to be low. In other words, God's way up is down. Before us, upon the pages of Scripture, we have the beautiful sample of Jesus' earthly life. From his humble beginning there in the feed trough in Bethlehem stable to the washing of his friend's feet in the upper room. All that we purview is a grand display of humility. Then the culmination. We learn from his beating, his utter degradation, his rejection. You know, Isaiah described it prophetically as, quote, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth. It's Isaiah 53, 7. This is humility. In Hebrews 12, 2, it says that he despised the shame of the cross. But this was not because of pride. We must understand that this word translated despise or despising means to, quote, think little of. And that is is its connotation elsewhere in the New Testament. So, of course, Christ thought little of the shame compared to the eternal joy that awaited. Oh, but you might think, yes, but this humble behavior was because he was found as a man and emptied of his divine powers. You know, in Philippians 2.5, you might be linking his humility to his humanity. And, of course, there was a positional humility or lowness therein, However, it is missing the mark to view Christ's humble character solely as the result of his human condition and as something otherwise uncharacteristic of him as our risen Lord of all. Consider his appearances to the disciples after his resurrection. There were no bands playing on earth, (laughs) no pomp, no General MacArthur like I have returned, but rather he was mistaken for a gardener. In another case, an out-of-touch traveler. In another case, a stranger on the beach. In fact, in John 21, when the disciples came ashore, he had a breakfast cooking for them. Does this sound like the behavior of the king of heaven and earth? (laughs) No, not to our carnal minds it doesn't. We give lip service to the concept of a noble humility, And we'll even go so far as to appear humble now and then, especially in church. Um, But all the while, we know that our hearts scream inside for accolades, attention, and gratefulness from both people and God. We've been infected with Satan's poisonous attitude. He said in Isaiah 14, 14, quote, "'I will ascend above the heights of the clouds.'" I will be like the Most High. Well, ponder this. Our sin-filled minds think up is up, that greatness comes by mastery. We even miss the fact that although the church held mastery over the Western world for hundreds of years, it never brought in the kingdom of God, but rather a good deal of death and cruel domination. We don't recognize that sin has warped us 180 degrees. In God's economy, if I can call it that, we discover the eternal reality, that is, up, is down. The highway of holiness is the low way of humility. Jesus, knowing our hearts, said, If anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and set him in the midst, and when he had taken him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one of these little children in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me but him who sent me. It's Mark 9. That's perfect. For the best approximation we have of humility, this life is our children. Jesus was saying, that entrance to and enjoyment of heaven is immersed in humility, not just an outward appearance, but a character trait running through and through. In that humble moment of receiving him by faith, 
you are most like him in character, and thus a relationship begins. Now you may say, oh, you're going overboard. You're making too much of this. Even God commands reverence and worship. Uh, We're made in his image. Why shouldn't we deserve a little respect? After all, humility will never get me anywhere in the here and now. People will just walk all over me. First of all, when God commands us to worship, it's because he knows who he is and who he's dealing with. Like the one who has to slap a hysterical person to get some sane attention. Our sin natures are so out of touch, we frankly need to be commanded at times. Second, he doesn't do it for his own sake. He doesn't need it. He does it for our sake. We do. Well, next, you may be right about the outcome of humility in this world, at least some of the time. But God's instruction and the attributes of a heavenly character are not really designed to feather our earthly temporal nests, so to speak. Rather, he wants to prepare you and me for life in eternity. It is for our eternal benefit. Your acceptance of this lesson is based upon what you value most, the temporary treasures of this life or the enduring ones of heaven. So where does this true humility come from? If it's not just a matter of outward deeds, but of inward character, where can we buy humility for dummies? Is there a humility 101? Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty nine, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, that is, humble. In referring to the practice of yoking a young ox to one who thoroughly understood the work at hand and thus teaching the younger one the ropes, Jesus was clearly saying that his gentle, humble character is imparted as we plow with him, that is, walk with him, work with him, and at times this will be humbling. Yet a very wise pastor of mine, speaking of men, once said, there is no humility without humiliation. Yes, his yoke is easy and his burden is light, Matthew 11.30, but with it will undoubtedly come some much-needed lowering, pun intended. So when it comes, and it will, because you're no prima donna, nor am I, recognize it for what it is, God's loving hand. He's crafting not a life designed to bring you merely the respect of men, but the rewards of heaven. You know, when our dear boy went home to be with the Lord, one kind man, a vice principal who had known him at school, sent us the following note. It said, quote, I saw something that showed me yet another side of Gabe. One of the ladies in the attendance office got pretty mean with him when he brought a note to the office. She ended up ridiculing Gabe's voice, doubting that he was being honest. You see, he had a raspy voice because of a congenital vocal cord deformity. And he continues, but Gabe was very calm and seemed to take no offense at all. He gently explained that he really did talk this way. I saw the patience of Christ's love that day. Hmm. I mention this only to point out that people do notice our walk. They recognize when someone has been yoked with Jesus for a while. Now, incidentally, it takes oxen a long time to learn how to plow right, sometimes years. Likewise, it can take a long time for some of us to begin walking like our yoke fellow, Jesus. Thus, a lowering, a humiliation, can work in us to bring about the more Christ-like character we long for inwardly, and which those who are headed for heaven appreciate. Therefore, let no humbling circumstance drag you down. Rather, go with it. Go willingly God's way and discover the peaceful joy of His humble heart. There, I know you'll find why his yoke is light. There, you'll be higher than the heavens. There, you'll find the awesome fellowship of humility with the Most High. Now, may the Lord grant you peace in the midst of any storm and faith to trust him. Look for our next podcast, and may you realize more of his grace today.